Hi, I'm Malika Bilal and you're in the stream. Today we're talking about the Kalashnikov Assault Rifle or AK-47. Just what makes it the world's most popular gun? We'll discuss its history and legacy and we want to hear your questions and comments about it. Share your thoughts via Twitter or in our live YouTube chat. Hello, I'm Dr. Charmaine Nelson, Professor of Art History at McGill University in Montreal and you are in the stream. Russia is commemorating 100 years since the birth of famed Soviet weapon inventor Mikhail Kalashnikov. For the Russian Ministry of Education, it is an opportunity to teach school-aged children about Kalashnikov, who was hailed a national hero and died in 2013 at the age of 94. Online, Russians are using the hashtag Kalashnikov100 to share their thoughts on his life and legacy. Larissa offers this insight. The machine gun invented by him became a symbol of Russia, as well as the most widespread small arms in history. Radio Stadoba tweets it's important to protect Kalashnikov's memory, just as his invention helped protect Russians. On Instagram, people are using that same hashtag. Here, he's commemorated on postage stamps and lapel pins. And the military offers a look at an in-progress memorial that will be installed at a museum in St. Petersburg later this month. Meanwhile, Kalashnikov Media put together an immersive website to help you learn more about his life. We heard from the project's editor-in-chief, Andrei Mikhaev. Мы в Калашников Медиа, безусловно, не могли обойти вниманием такую важную дату, как 100 лет со дня рождения Михаила Тимофеевича Калашникова. Долго думали и в итоге решили пойти не совсем традиционным путем и рассказать на этот раз не столько про его оружие, сколько про то, каким человеком был Михаил Тимофеевич. Для этого мы пообщались с его близкими друзьями, записали много интервью, съездили на его родину и из всего этого сделали онлайн-спецпроект, который оформили как его рабочий кабинет. Надеюсь, это станет интересным небольшим путешествием по жизни великого конструктора. So we've heard from people commemorating his legacy, but what do people in other parts of the world think? Joining us today to discuss in Poznan, Poland, Yunus Saramifar, a combat zone anthropologist and author of the book Living with the AK-47. Also with us, Jonathan Ferguson of Armament Research Services and the firearms curator at the Royal Armouries Museum in Leeds in the UK, from where he joins us. And in Doha, Maria Petkova, a journalist who covers the Middle East, the Balkans, and Eastern Europe. She's written for a variety of media outlets, including Al Jazeera. Welcome, everyone, to the show. So good to have you here. I want to start with our community, because they had a lot to say about this weapon, many familiar with it. I'll start here. Two opposing opinions. Wasif says it symbolizes terror, mass murder and lethal violence, to say the very least. So that's one person's perspective. I'll give you another person who wrote in. And this is just minutes after we sent out this tweet to our community telling them we're doing this show. Ivan Ash says, well, the AK symbolizes freedom to me. When I look at the AK-47, it was instrumental in the freedom of Zimbabwe, Mozambique. It symbolizes great ingenuity. So Jonathan, you, you see these two opposing sides there, although both can still be true. Can you give us the backstory? How did this come about? Sure. Yeah, I, I totally see why there'd be extreme views and views in the middle as well. Um, the, as to origins, um, Mikhail Kalashnikov was a, a military man himself, a tank crewman who was injured, uh, turned his mind to the design of small arms, uh, came up with a submachine gun, uh, worked on a carbine, and ended up in charge of a, a design team working on a new concept, the assault rifle. So combining different types of weapon into one, essentially. Something that would do all of the jobs of an infantry unit. Uh, automatic fire, medium range, controllable fire as well. Um, so uh, th this was based in part on a German German concept from the Second World War, the Sturmgewehr, um, where we get the assault rifle from. This is very much the Russian take on that design. Mm -hmm. I want to play a video comment from a, a member of our community who had some thoughts on the creator. Uh, this is Aaron Karp. He's a political science lecturer in the U.S. here in Virginia. And here's what he told the stream. He'd been plucked out of obscurity to lead a new research development program. The weapons program that he was involved in, um, it wasn't creating the most sophisticated gun ever. 
Quite the opposite. It was the simplest firearm. And the result was to make warfare easy for amateurs. In the 1960s and the 1970s, we saw the consequences. Guerrilla warfare everywhere. In the 1980s, his rival made possible the spread of global terrorism. In the 1990s, it was directly responsible for the spread of child soldiers. The idea of having not more sophisticated technologies in the future, but simpler, easier to operate technologies, that's Kalashnikov's. That was his insight. Eunice, what do you make of Aaron's comment there, especially the point where he says it was the simplest firearm? Is that true in your view? And is it, is it still true? So it's quite a simple uh, firearm to operate, but it was not a firearm who amplified violence. Violence existed in different ways in the underlying structure of societies, be it in Africa or be it in Middle East or Central Asia. Basically, it highlighted further. So the simplicity is one thing, but the symbolism which produced in different societies around it, it allowed it to become such an appealing element. So you have nowadays quite a much of militia fighters across Middle East who do not prefer necessarily AK-47 anymore, and they have access to other arms. So it produced a certain form of cultural habituation as well, besides the fact it's a simple weaponry, it's quite easy to operate, it's quite, it has a quite resilience and longevity, but it, had, it has a lot of symbolic potential, and it has a lot of aesthetic appeal also. So those elements basically made it elements of violence or elements of highlighting violence. But those violence have always existed. If AK-47 was not there, something else would make it much more vibrant. Mm. As you're speaking, Maria, just... Maria was nodding her head. Maria, you go first, and, and then Jonathan, sure. Jonathan, you come in after. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was actually quite surprised. Uh, uh, with, about uh, Aaron's uh, assessment of the AK-47 that it caused somehow terrorism and violence and all that stuff. Um, if there was no AK-47, if Kalashnikov hadn't been around um, however many decades ago to invent it, there would have been another weapon that would have been produced that would have resulted in the exact same thing. So when we're talking about violence or when we're talking about insurgency, um, terrorism and so on, all these different types of warfare today, we have to look at geopolitics and we have to think about when the AK-47 was born. And it was born as the Cold War was beginning. And what was the Cold War doing? It was there were two superpowers that were interested in influencing the world. And one way to influence the world was to provide weapons to different forces on the ground in different countries and to support their cause, right? So this is what the AK-47 did for the USSR. It basically supported certain causes that the USSR wanted politically to succeed. The US was also supplying weapons to different factions, different parties, different countries, governments, and so on. Um, so to blame everything bad that's happening in the world in terms of uh, violence, you know, terrorism and so on, it's, I think, a bit of an exaggeration right now. Mm -hmm. Jonathan? I was going to say something similar. Um, if it wasn't the AK, it would have been something else. And that something else is the AR-15. Mm. Uh, <laughs> if we have 75... Which, which was million... the United States' answer, in a way, correct? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, we talked just then about uh, different states providing arms to different actors. Um, sometimes the United States did supply Kalashnikov rifles because it, it fitted the, mm -hmm. the time, the place, whatever. Um, but if we, if we think in terms of the numbers, so 75 million Kalashnikov um, direct uh, variants minimum in the world, probably more. The next most numerous is the AR-15, uh, America's favorite rifle, arguably, certainly the, the U.S. military's rifle. That's at 11 million. So it's a lot a lot lower uh, quantity-wise, but i starting to catch up, and it's simple in its own way. It, in fact, it has, this is something, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say myth about the Kalashnikov, that it's easy to use. Mm -hmm. It's definitely simple. Mm. What it isn't is particularly ergonomic. Mm. Um, so the controls are few and, and quite simple, but they're not kind of the way you would want them to be 
if you were starting from scratch, if that makes sense. Um, they were made to be as simple as possible. That's great for mass production. And with conscript soldiers, um, that's fine. You know, you, well, that's, that was the starting point at any rate. Right. And it's perfectly adequate, perfectly great for um, professional armies as well. But just like the British Army rifle, you kind of have to train around that. Mm -hmm. the, the AR-15 is like a gold standard for firearms ergon ergonomics, I would, I would say. Um, and it's simple in its own way without getting into the technicalities of that. <laughs> so had the, had the time, it, it's, it's a product of its time um, and the manufacturing techniques of the time as well. The M16, AR-15 could not be so easily or so cheaply made at the time, um, possibly not even now. So, so the AK was in the right so place Jonathan, at the right as, time. I, I love that that's how you summed it up, because Jonathan, I wanted to bring in this comment we got from someone watching on, on, on YouTube. Uh, Amani yeah. says, explaining the reason that it is everywhere, is that you can only do that with a low maintenance weapon. The simple ease of use of the AK allowed the Soviets to then give them away. So I want to show our audience, because I know our guests probably already know this. I want to show our audience the places uh, that it has traveled, uh, at least models of the AK. So this is Mozambique's national flag. You might notice it there. You, you, you saw it in a, the first tweet that I read on the, today's show it explained that there. This, uh, quite an interesting one, Saddam Hussein's gold-plated AK-47 that was found by, after the U.S. invasion of Iraq. And this last one is a whole list via Mike. Ten photos that show how the AK-47 has become a global political symbol. I'll scroll to show you just a few. Chile, Iraq, Mozambique, Hezbollah, although some say this is a variant of the AK-47, not the AK-47 itself. But explaining uh, that and why it has really spread so many places, Eunice, I want to bring you in here on this. Why is there global appeal? How do you explain that global appeal? So my area of work is mostly, let's say, West Asia, Central Asia, and that I can talk much. But you see, there was a confluence of uh, time when, yeah, specifically in the 70s, when a lot of resistance groups, they met each other in the West Asia. And these groups, they understood they can talk to this, this simplicity of design of AK-47 together. They could train together, they can exchange, let's say, military knowledge through this simplicity. And then from there, when the first resistance groups, let's say like Hezbollah, they received this weapon, it became the symbol, uh, symbolic appearance, which, which something which always comes along with martyrs. So you see, if in any photo, when there's a martyr, there's an AK-47 there. So it became merged with the idea of martyrdom, and this emergence slowly, slowly produced the culture of resistance. So this culture of resistance of, uh, produced this symbolism and the aura around, mar uh, around AK-47. And for example, to give you a very a specific anecdote, uh, Ahmad Shah Masood, who basically was the commander of the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan, when he attended the funeral of a, uh, one of his commanders, immediately during the, uh, during the burial ceremony, he picked up the AK-47 and handed it to the brother of the, uh, the martyr and said, this is the weapon of a martyrdom. So will you promise to carry it further? So it has that aura. And however, now any weapon which has similarity of structure, it, it becomes Kalash. It becomes AK-47. Kalash, as it would be said in Central Asia or Middle East. So that symbolism, which is produced in social history, mm -hmm. it, had, it creates further appeal. Mm -hmm. And a lot of forms of masculinity and boyhood is being militarized in Middle East. So this militarization produces certain imagination, ideas of how to become a man. Mm. So AK-47 becomes an apparatus or accessory of, uh, let's say, certain male groups in, the, in West Asia. Mm. Uh, I think that's so our, fascinating. That's so uh, fascinating. I, I wrote that down and how to become a man, Eunice, because we're actually hearing from people who talk about the use of the AK by children, especially child soldiers. I wanted to share this from YouTube. Nathan says, as a U.S. military veteran, any weapon of war does not belong in civilian hands. I'm a fourth generation vet. My father faced child soldiers in Vietnam with AK-47s. And we also got a comment from a former child soldier himself in the South Sudan region in that conflict. Have a listen to Emmanuel Jal and 
Here's his experience with that gun. One of my experiences with AK-47 is it's light, it's easy to carry, and when you fire it, you enjoy the beat of it, the rhythm of it, carry it, it makes you strong and you feel strong. When my friend died, I had to carry his gun plus mine. What I can say now is that gun, no child should ever carry it again. As when we were growing, we were taught that AK-47 is our father and our mother, and we looked at it that way. Maria, what do you make of that comment? Um, it's actually really sad, um, and I wish there was a bit more awareness um, among the countries and the governments that decide to send these weapons uh, to different points around the world, whether it's Africa, whether it's Asia, the Middle East, Latin America. Um, funnily enough, actually, on the other side of, of um, uh, the process, the, the people who produce the gun, you can see that there is um, actually pride in it. There is no, there is no remorse. Um, there is no sense of guilt. There is no understanding that this gun has created a lot of uh, violence. It has created a lot of suffering. So you can see, I mean, that was the introduction of the program. You, you saw um, how in Russia... Um, this gun is perceived and also the maker of the gun. I can tell you in Bulgaria, for example, which received uh, through transfer technology the license, let's say, to produce it uh, during uh, the communist era. Uh, to this day, my country and many of my countrymates um, see the Bulgarian Kalashnikov as this superior Kalashnikov, yeah. So they, they don't, they haven't realized that, you know, um, during uh, the communist era, Bulgaria was exporting a large amounts of Kalashnikovs and other small arms. Um, after the fall of the regime, it continued to do so. Um, during the Yugoslav war, for example, Bulgaria was a huge source of weapons um, for that conflict, which was right next door. Um, then there were conflicts a bit further, but still close enough, um, let's say, in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and so on. And, you know, you can see the guns go as far as uh, places in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and I have traced, like, some weapons, Bulgarian-made weapons as far as Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so in Bulgaria, when you talk to a military man or, um, let's say, a weapons dealer, they will say proudly, the Bulgarian Kalashnikov is the best Kalashnikov in the world. <laughs> but if you ask this child soldier, if you ask right now a fighter in Syria, if you ask, you know, back in the day during the Vietnam War, a fighter um, in Vietnam, if they, you know, could recognize the Bulgarian Kalashnikov mm -hmm. and they could tell it apart from the Russian one or the Chinese knockoff, none of them would tell you, yes, mm -hmm. I can. Mm -hmm. no, no, none of them would say, like, yes, I proudly carry a Bulgarian uh, gun, a Bulgarian Kalashnikov. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that, for me, um, I would say is, is incredibly sad to see that there is this um, cognitive dissonance in a way between the people who produce the gun and the well, people who is, end up using it. Mm. This is absolutely, yeah, totally. Um, the idea that there are different flavors of Kalashnikov. Mm. Um, we, we lump everything in under AK-47, which is a problem in itself for, for people like us who try to track and record and write about these things, uh, because that at best describes only one of many um, offspring. So, <laughs> this, Jonathan, I'm, I'm glad you said that, because it's not often that we're able to show what we're talking about on the stream. You oh. have with you an AK-style <laughs> weapon. Can you show us yep. what makes it an AK? Yeah, well, the, my, um, the collection that we have, uh, the Royal Armouries, is extensive of Kalashnikovs. Um, I, I have one myself, which is not actually live. Thankfully um, for everyone involved. <laughs> well, it depends where you are, right? But, exactly. Um, <laughs> where I am, it would probably get me in trouble. So um, this is actually a factory-made uh, dummy gun. So this mm -hmm. is used for training. Mm -hmm. Um, instructional purpose. So it's the same as a real um, Kalashnikov AK-74M. Mm -hmm. So this is circa 1990s and still in use today in the Russian Armed Forces 
uh, weapons very much like it in, in many other uh, armed forces. Um, Russia has modernized recently with the AK-12, the AK-15. So we just see iteration after iteration, um, even from, from Russia, um, who, who are still sticking by that basic mechanical design, and then around the world. Um, so the main difference here is that this one is chambered in a smaller, or with a smaller bullet in the cartridge, mm -hmm. which is uh, higher velocity, flatter shooting, more like the American M16 um, type uh, concept, if that makes sense. Yes. Other than that, it's the same as the AKM, which is a particular type of AK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so strictly AK-47 is only the prototype and the trials rifles. So we use AK, which is uh, actually easier, but it, it's a bit late because the world has already uh, branded the whole thing. AK-47. Well, I thank you for dispelling some I myths and, like and, and explaining that to us. Um, Yunus, I hear you're trying to get in, but I, I want to add one more thing, and I'll direct this to you because I do want to share this with the world for those who don't know. This is a headline. It's from 2014. Weapons designer Kalashnikov repented AK-47 killings in a letter before his death. Uh, uh, it, this is uh, reported by uh, a Russian daily. The pain in my soul is unbearable. I keep asking myself the same unsolvable question. If my assault rifle took people lives that means I am responsible for people's deaths now there was an interview a little clip of Kalashnikov's daughter speaking at a museum exhibit earlier this year in September here's what she said he was a quiet man who was of very short stature he was very modest he had great self-restraint he was a very wise man he only came out on the world stage, so to speak, in the 1990s. And before that, our family was kept secret. The kids were kept secret. And everything was kept secret. Eunice, as we're playing that, someone watching on YouTube says, the gun is not to blame those who put it in the hands of children. If it wasn't the AK, it would have been another weapon, probably an American-made one, a point that has been raised earlier here. Eunice, what did you want to add? So I wanted to add, there is one thing which we'll learn around this interesting, let's say, lethal object, is that the political economy of USSR and how even USSR socially produced this idea, let's say, not manufactured as a piece of machinery, as an, an idea. Because if you look at the way how it became so pervasive, because uh, USSR tolerated its knockoff version and, and all the copycats. So it was the form of a decentralization of power, because we imagine USSR as a point of authority and absolute authoritarianism. But even just you look at it, travel of this object is basically AK-47, we see how it allowed to power to be decentralized and everybody produces, uh, produce, let's say, a little object. And at the same time, so uh, USSR locked all the, let's say, friendly country through Warsaw Pact and not by giving them also the AK-47, but locking them through the ammunition because the ammunition basically which is, I, if, I, if I say it correctly, I think it's 4.54 uh, or 4.4. They were locked 5. in 4. that 4. basically 5. production sorry. of... Yeah. No, thank yes, you for sorry. that. Yes, correct. Yeah, 5.45. They were locked in that production of ammunition, and they were locked with the continuation of the production of AK-47. So it was more... Uh, there was a lot of political thinking around how let such a little object become a dominating weapon in the certain areas. Mm -hmm. So it's great, it's simple, it's so on and so, which we talk a lot, but there was much more into it. There was a lot of political mm -hmm. loading into it. Mm -hmm. The ammunition Eunice, is, is uh, critical. Eunice Sarmafar, Jonathan Ferguson, thank you for adding that in and clarifying a little bit. Unfortunately, I have to pause you as well as Maria Petkova. Thank you so much for joining us. That's all the time we have for this conversation, but so much more to say. It can happen online. Hashtag AJStream at AJStream. Thank you for joining us and thanks to our community for sharing your thoughts. We'll see you online.